I guess it's a good time to start. I'm, I'm Peter Schwartz. I'm the director of the IU Center for Bioethics, and I am just thrilled to be here today to introduce our speaker, Professor Ott, uh, who is about to go to the slide, which was going to uh, have a description of our of our seminar series on it. Um, she's the um, the inaugural speaker for our series on health equity, race, and ethics, a series that she's very much been behind uh, moving forward for us and getting started. And we're thrilled to offer this. I think uh, probably everybody on this call uh, is aware of the incredibly important issues uh, with equity and race in health. Uh, and as, this, as a center for ethics in, in medicine and in bio, bioethics in general, uh, we, we want to be part of a conversation and uh, efforts to, to make a change. Now, this series has a, a slant and a, and a focus within this enormous range of topics. And that is to look at issues in health equity uh, and diversity that raise questions about how to do ethics at all and, and perhaps also how to make change. Um, and so each of our speakers will address a topic in equity, inclusion and diversity. Uh, and we'll think, bring that back to the question of doing ethics and ethics frameworks. Now, Professor Ott is perfect to kick this off uh, beyond being uh, very much behind this happening at all. Uh, so I want to thank her for that and for everything else she does for the IU Center for Bioethics and the IU School of Medicine. But now I guess get to brag about who she is, that she's a faculty investigator here at the Center for Bioethics and a professor of pediatrics at the School of Medicine, as well as an, an adjunct professor of philosophy in our master's program in bioethics here and the fellowship director of the adolescent medicine program. Uh, everything else you need to know about her, I think you'll, she'll mention or she'll, um, you'll figure it out from what she talks about. She's a world leading expert, I'll say, in adolescent medicine and ethics, including uh, in clinical care and also in research. Um, finally, I'm gonna let uh, Professor Ott handle her questions herself when she finishes. I'll just be here quietly and see if I can help in any way. But um, I will, I guess I will watch the chats. Maybe we didn't actually talk about this before, uh, but if I see anything in the chats, I may, I may um, highlight that for Mary. It's hard to, uh, to speak and answer questions and also watch the chat, but she's welcome to do that as well. So I'll um, hand it over here to Professor Ott. And I get to say that you're on mute, which is always fun to say, even after a year and a half of Zoom, it's, uh, well, thank you, Peter, and for the kind introduction, or mostly kind introduction, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, and as Peter said, this is the inaugural talk of our HERE series, um, and I wanna start um, with a land acknowledgement. Um, IUPUI stands on the ancestral lands of the Miami, Potomotomi, and Shawnee people, and additionally, founded in 1969, it displaced a vibrant black community. And we, before starting the talk, we wanted to, to acknowledge these injustices. Okay. I do have a disclosure. My spouse works for Eli Lilly. And I have an acknowledgement. Um, some of the work um, the conceptual work with this talk came out of a set of papers that I wrote shortly after the pandemic started. And Caitlin Bernard, an OBGYN faculty member, really assisted with some of the practical applications of con conceptual frameworks to inequities in abortion and other reproductive health services. Um, and then I have like, and so then we're going to talk about public health goals and ethics, but. Um, and, um, and I have um, another um, sort of disclosure is that I come as an adolescent medicine physician first and an ethicist second. And so um, my perspective on ethics has always been a very applied practical perspectives, like how can these theoretical frameworks work for me? How can they work to advance the health of the young people that I serve and that I support? And so, um, so I come to you like so this that my goal is to like give you some ethics frameworks and then talk about some of the practical applications 
of these frameworks in our everyday lives. Um, so we did have public health in the blurb, so I'll start with public health. But the public health goals are, um, are, are for youth and for reproductive health are to maximize sexual and reproductive health and well-being um, using a human rights-based approach. And I'm going to go into that in, in some detail. And then to ensure social justice by reducing reproductive health disparities. Um, public health ethics, I pulled from the CDC, um, is um, a field of practice. And public health ethics is the application of relevant principles and values to public health decision making. So I feel that that, that really captures sort of my work and a lot of the work we do at the IU Center for Bioethics. I'm going to talk about two ethics frameworks. The first is taking a human rights framework, and then the second is using what I call least restrictive solutions. Um, and this has came up quite a bit um, with um, the COVID pandemic and the deepening disparities that we saw with some of the public health um, restrictions. So, um, I first want to talk about what human rights are, because human rights have very little traction in the United States. Um, when we think about rights, particularly minors' rights, we think about constitutional rights, we think about positive rights. Um, these rights are given to us by virtue of our being US citizens. Um, for young people, some of their rights are based on age. So. Um, um, and human rights differ a little bit. Um, human rights are universal. So they belong to all people. Um, human rights are additionally inalienable, which means they cannot be taken away. They're in interconnected. Um, one human right is dependent upon other human rights. And we'll see, we see this a lot in adolescent reproductive health. So young people's rights to education have ha has a huge influence on um, globally child mar marriage, um, more locally, like um, early childbearing um, and, and other types of um, reproductive health effects. Um, human rights are indivisible, so they can't be treated in isolation. And they're non-discriminatory, so they need to be respected without prejudice. So they're really, human rights are something that are in intrinsic based upon our shared humanity. Um, as a pediatrician and adolescent specialist, I look to the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, for um, to th as I, when I think about human rights for young people. And over the past 20 years, the Convention on the Right, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, has issued several comments that specifically explore young people's human rights, the, the, the child's human rights during adolescence. And so adolescents are rights holders. Um, adolescents have the same human rights as adults. Um, they have the rights to the highest attainable health. In this case, it would be sexual and reproductive health. Um, the human rights, the frameworks talk about the progressive exercise of these rights with evolving capacity. So ad as adolescents have capacity to make decisions, to make health-related decisions, they should have that right to make these health-related decisions. Um, and this is really different than some of um, our sort of fairly legal frameworks that we use in the United States, where um, young people's rights are sort of based on age or particular status and are sort of legal bright lines, like young people over 18 can vote. Um, their young people's human rights include the rights to sexual and reproductive health, um, and that includes contraception and safe abortion, HIV and STD um, screening um, and linkage to care, um, freedom from violence, their rights to choose their own partners and make their own decisions about childbearing, and their rights to receive complete and accurate sexual health information. So the rights to contraception, HIV, freedom from violence are really um, predicated on young people receiving accurate, medically accurate information on these topics. And finally, young people have the right to be heard, to challenge violations, and seek redress. 
So the other piece about human rights frameworks that I really like is they really, they in, in the US we have, when we have think about like positive rights and constitutional rights, I'm always battling sort of the rights of the kids and the rights of the parents. Um, but human rights frameworks really shifts their conceptualization of the role of the parents, which takes it out of a battle with the adolescent. Um, so there's no bright line. Um, for young children, the role of the parents is to make, is making decisions, making health-related decisions for them. Um, as adolescents develop capacity, and this capacity really starts at the middle school age level. So when we look at capacity data, young people start to have the cognitive ability to make decisions really like sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Um, and going then, then the parents' role shift to supporting the young people in making healthy decisions. So in this way, I as an adolescent specialist and the parent can be working toward together to help the young person realize their human rights um, to, to the best obtainable health. Um, the role of parents includes providing direction and guidance consistent with their evolving capacity, taking into account the adolescent's views, and providing a safe and supportive environment for adolescents to exercise those rights. So the other piece I really like about human rights frameworks for young people is like their rights aren't there in a vacuum. So the, the human rights frameworks addresses the role of the parents, but it also addresses the role of the state. And I'm thinking specifically because we're talking about rights around sexual and reproductive health, the role of, this, of state policies in supporting adolescents' rights to sexual and reproductive health. So states are, are required to recognize, at, have their policies specifically recognize adolescents' unique vulnerabilities. For example, they don't have legal rights around entering contracts, um, owning property, things like that. Young people have less access to resources. Young people may, young people are in school and their education is really important to their rights, so, so their exercise of rights and their health and health equity. Um, uh, state policies, states are required to support to support health systems that meet adolescent sexual health needs, including contraception and safe abortion. Like states are required to provide sexual health information and services. And to do this um, while respecting young people's privacy and confidentiality, including offering services without parental consent. States are finally required to educate and support parents because this is, I can tell you as a parent of a teen, this is a difficult even for an adolescent parent, adolescent medicine parent to do, but we wanna support parents, enhance parents' capacity to build relationships of trust and confidence with their adolescents. So three pieces to human rights framework. The person's human rights based on their shared humanity, the role of the parents for young people from making decisions to supporting decisions, and then the role of the state. So with that human rights background, I wanna switch over to health equity in sexual and reproductive health, because that's really the, the push of our series. So I went to the world, I really like the World Health Organization definition of equity. So they talk about equity as the absence of unfair, avoidable, are remedial differences among groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, geographically, or by other dimensions of inequality, like sex, gender, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation. Um, health is a fundamental human right. So it, it specifically links health equity to human, the human right to health. Um, and health equity is achieved when everyone can attain their full potential for health and well-being. Um, the WHO further um, talks about how social determinants of health influence health equity. So if you look to the right-hand side of the screen, like where we want is health equity, and health equity is really directly a result of the environments where we're born, where we grow up, where we live, where we work, where we play. Um, these in turn, these environments are determined by structural factors. So the political climate, the legal climate, economic supports, the social norms that influence our environment, and then institutions and institutional processes. And these three things um, determine sort of power structures and power dynamics that influence the in environment. 
So, and then, then let's look now at disparities. So um, Indiana is the 12th high, has the 12th highest rate of teen births in the nation with 2019 data. Um, and this is 12th, this is highest, so this is not good. Like we wanna be at the other end of the scale of 50 states in the District of Columbia. We have really marked racial and ethnic inequities. So teen pregnancy rates across the board are about 21 per thousand 15 to 19 year olds. For white adolescents, they're about 18. For Latinx, 30. And for black adolescents, 34 and a half. We also see marked disparities by rurality. So I don't know if that's a word, um, but the, <laughs> The 15 counties in Indiana with the highest teen birth rates are all rural. In these counties, their birth rates range from like 31 to 50. And not all of them are so small that the numbers are unstable. So these are really like one and a half to two and a half times the overall state rate. Um, so we see market inequities both by race and ethnicity and geography and teen births. Um, the, uh, and this is a little bit of a busy, busy slide, but I want you to look at just the colors. So we also, the other sort of sexual and reproductive health outcome that we see are um, is STIs that really markedly and disproportionately affects youth. So you only have to look at the shape of the graph on the left. And I chose chlamydia because it's the most impressive, um, but gonorrhea looks fairly similar. It just doesn't have a steep a curve. Um, but if you look, what we have from the, the top are 10 to 14 year olds, and it goes down by five year age range to 65 plus year olds, and then they have the rates. Um, and you can see the rates for young women of chlamydia are much higher than the rates for young men. And then the rates for adolescent and young adult women for 15 to 24 year old, our youth, are markedly higher than any other age range. So we have a market age related disparity in um, chlamydia and some of the other STIs. Um, to the right, you can see we also have geographic disparities. So um, for this map, this map of the United States are gonorrhea positive tests um, among young people entering a program called the Job Corps. And the Job Corps provides high school and post high school training in practical skills. And there are another, there's a Job Corps site outside of Indianapolis. Um, and what they did in, on entry, all young people going into got Job Corps get a physical that includes an STI screen. And their 2019 screen, that's the most recent year data are available, is shown on the, um, on the map. And what you see is Indiana is this incredibly dark blue. Um, and so really showing that our state has um, disproportionate rates of gonorrhea among this sort of group of young people entering Job Corps. So um, the final areas that we have are disparities um, by race. And I also have region in this because this um, graph is from the CDC and they broke it down by region. So the Midwest region is, is, is the bright Colts blue. It's the second bar in. And they have rates for white adolescents are one. And everybody else is compared to white adolescents. Um, and so what we see is that the one group that has lower rates than white adolescents are Asian adolescents. Um, all of the other groups, American, Indian, and Alaskan Native, Black, Hispanic, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander all have rates that are significantly higher um, than white adolescents. Um, and we see this in specifically in our Midwest region. So this isn't a problem of the coast or a problem of the deep south. This is a problem about home. The other thing I wanted to talk about when we think about disparities is there's been a big, a lot of thinking about bias, implicit bias and explicit bias. And I want you to sort of think about like what we hear about teens and sexuality. So we hear like all teens are doing it. Teens are having sex at younger ages than when I was a young person. Um, teens are poor users of contraceptives. Teens are hooking up rather than committing to relationships. And boys want sex and girls want love. 
Um, and so these are things like like these. Do these sound common? Some of them. Some of us may feel this way and may think this way. Um, and there. And what I'm going to say is, when we look at the data, like every single one of these is false. Like the median age for starting to have sex is still over 17 years of age. It's 17.1 and 17.2, depending on gender, um, which really hasn't markedly shifted in the last 30 years or so that we've been collecting data on this. Um, teens are not poor users of contraceptives. They're actually better condom users than adults. Um, and so like 75 to 85% of teens um, uh, will use um, contraception, which is at, not perfect, but like as good or better than adults. Um, and then this idea of hooking up in relationships. When we look at the context of teens' first sexual relationship, um, for um, over 80% of girls and over 70% of boys, they were in what they considered an intimate, close relationship with the individual the first time they had sex. Um, and the final, like, boys want sex, girls want love, I mean, when we look at surveys and interviews with adolescent boys, they have just as much of an interest in connecting with their partner and having intimacy as girls. And so, um, and I bring up the biases, they're sort of fun to look at, but they also really color the kind of policies and the kind of programming, um, the kind of services that young people were offered. I mean, if you truly believe that boys want sex and girls want love, then you're gonna take a really different approach to sexual health education. If you think that teens are poor contraceptive users, what's that going to do to how we counsel young people and access to contraceptives? Um, if we think that all teens are having sex, or they're having sex at a really young age, what does that say about screening and that type of thing? So I think it's really important to think about these kinds of biases that underlie disparities because these biases drive our like clinical care, our public health programming, our education, and our outreach. So um, this is again, sort of a policy talk. So I went to try and dig up policies like legislation affecting adolescent sexual and reproductive health. And I had like a list that was a whole page long. And so, um, and then I was like, I was tired, okay? And I was like, what does this look like in a word cloud? And so, and you know, but the point is like a myriad of policies affect um, adolescent sexual and reproductive health. And I'm actually gonna go, I'm gonna go two because I just started to list them out like state health care consent laws, can minors access care, consent for their own care, do they need parental permission? Title 10 legislation, Title 10 is federal funding that um, covers family planning services and specifically requires services for teens to be confidential. Title 10 legislation has been slashed and a lot of um, barriers have been put into Title 10 legislation. So it's an area where we desperately need advocacy. Um, federally qualified health centers, Medicaid and healthcare financing reform all drive contraceptive access because uh, teens disproportionately um, and children in general are much more likely to have um, government sponsored insurance like Medicaid. Um, and a lot of young people use federally qualified health centers and other sources of Medicaid. Things like laws that defund family planning providers markedly affect contraceptive access. Pharmacist prescribing laws could open contraceptive access telehealth laws, the FDA's over-the-counter policies, the Affordable Care Act, you know, so all of these things affect young people's contraceptive access. So, and what we find in Indiana is we have markedly inequitable contraceptive access. So I'm gonna start out, the first thing is not linked, the map is linked to the second bullet, but my first comment is um, over 50, percent of women in Indiana live in what's called a contraceptive desert. It means there's no designated family planning provider in their county or within like a certain radius around where they live. Um, and we say, okay, but like family medicine doctors, pediatricians, um, our nurse practitioners, they are all really great about screening for young people for sexual behavior and providing at least some forms of contraception. And so what we see is, in fact, um, much of Indiana, and this is the map, the dark blue are all primary care, health care, sh health profession shortage areas for primary care. So almost all of the rural counties in the state are considered um, 
a health professional shortage area. So another source of contraceptive access. And then finally, like particularly um, sped up with the pandemic are alternative types of access to contraception. So a number, um, 11 states have passed laws that allow pharmacists to prescribe and dispense contraception. So it's like one stop shopping, sort of like there's a pharmacy in almost every neighborhood, even if there's not a primary care provider. Like pharmacists, most young people are low risk and the protocols are set up for pharmacists to provide contraception to low risk individuals. Um, Indiana does not have pharmacist prescribing laws. Um, apps, so people may, may have seen NERCs or Pandia Health or one of the other um, apps where women can get contraceptive access. And you sort of get on the app and you provide your medical information and then they use telehealth laws and you have a telehealth visit with um, a provider um, who assesses um, your medical history, and then you can have birth control sent to your home, all app-based. Um, and these um, approaches aren't available to young people because of healthcare consent laws. So when we talked about these policies sort of driving contraceptive access. So, I mean, it, access is an, an area where we really, it, there's a desperate need um, in desperate inequities based on age. And it's really important because when we look at unintended pregnancy for young people, though, this is a national survey of family growth analysis. So this is sta st nationwide. They looked at the, the declines in teen pregnancy rates and teen pregnancy rates have declined like 50% since the late 90s. And when they analyzed what the declines were due for, 14% were due to decre decreases in sexual activity. So again, think back to our like people's like biases towards teens, like teens are having sex at a younger, younger age, not really. Um, and then 86% of the decrease is due to increasing contraceptive use, primarily emergency contraception and long acting reversible contraception. So what we see is these decline, these market declines in teen pregnancies are really driven by policies, and like we can use and and and, and policies are potentially a way for us to expand access and decrease these disparities. So. Contraception. The other thing I wanted to talk about as an example of disparities are sex education. And so you have to sort of think about like what are our Indiana Department of Education sex education standards. Um, so required sex education, schools are required to teach AIDS instruction. If but they're not required for general sex education. If they choose to have general sex education, they must stress abstinence until marriage as the standard um, for all humans. And, you know, as the standard, as it, like as the standard. And so, and this is like, prob abstinence is a good thing for young people to wait to have sex, but requiring abstinence until marriage, like what about um, groups that don't have the um, legal ability to marriage? What about our young LGBT youth? Um, then schools are required to make two attempts for written parental permission. And if they, if they get no, res for the parents, so the parents can decline or approve. And if they get no response to parents, they can assume parental, um, the parents are okay. So this is like a combination of opt out or opt in. And not something that is done with the rest of our science classes. So, um, you know, when they're teaching ecology or when they're teaching chemistry, we don't have like two attempts for written parental permission and then an opt out and opt in. Um, not required in our Department of Education standards or to teach sex ed at all, it's not required. Um, it's not required to be comprehensive or medically accurate. And it's not required to include information on consent, which is really critical for young people for gender or sexual orientation. So it's not, they're not required to be inclusive. Um, and so what does it look like when we have these types of policies? Um, and what we have are inequities um, for kids in Indiana compared to other states. So the CDC analyzes, has something, a, a survey they call school health profiles. And one of the, some of the questions on the school health profile deal with sex education. And so when they looked at like, 
among Indiana schools that teach sex education, they have like, at the time of this survey in 2015, they had um, 19 essential topics that's since subsequently been increased to 20. But I just pulled out some of the essential topics. So healthy and respectful relationships, contraception other than condoms, gender roles, identity and expression, how to correctly use a condom, and making sure your instruction is LGBTQ inclusive. Um, and what we find is like 96% taught healthy relationships, 62% taught contraception other than condoms, 50% taught about gender roles, gender identity or gender expression, 41% taught how to use a condom, and 41% were LGBT inclusive. And so, you know, so this is an, a disparity in access to education. And I'm going to go back to the front of my talk because I started talking about young people are rights holders and they have human rights. And those human rights include the right to um, access sexual and reproductive health services. Part of that access is the right to medically accurate and complete information on sexual health. And so our, the disparities that we see um, in, for kids in Indiana compared to other states that have more, um, that have str stronger sex education laws are that our, our young people really are like we're, this is like a human rights violation. This is like they're not given medically correct information on these topics. So COVID is something that we've saw. So this is not data oriented. This is these rates are based on sort of reports that I've been reading and following. But as far as we can tell, COVID policies really deepen sexual and reproductive health inequities. And if we think back a year ago when we really closed clinics, we went completely to telehealth decreased a lot of our safety net services. I mean, young people like I feel I and I don't have this statistic for the talk, but like certainly about three quarters of young people have government insurance and um, rather than private insurance and are thus many of them are, are dependent upon safety net services. Um, and while we have good safety net services in Indianapolis, when we get outside of Indianapolis, it's not so good. Um, the other thing that we did was we did a big switch to telehealth and we started doing a lot of visits on telehealth, which was wonderful for established patients with insurance whose parents were supportive, who had Wi-Fi access and a device at home. Um, but what we found with telehealth and the drop in safety net services is like this is really like there's going to be a decrease in con what we think is a decrease in confidential care. It's really hard to assure confidentiality. I mean, adolescent providers were like, pick up your iPad. Is there anyone in the room with you? If the mom's in the room, I said, point it at your mom. Let me say hi to your mom. I'm going to ask your mom to step out of the room. I'm going to ask them, you know, is there a basement? Is there a second floor you can go to? Is there a door you can close? Um, and so it's really hard to have confidential care via telehealth um, for young people, and they have to be established patients. So, you know, walk-in services, things like that are markedly decreased. The other thing that we don't see that we've really seen drops in are LARC placements um, for young people. And I can talk about like the service provision side rather than the data side, because it'll take another year or two before we get preliminary data on um, LARC use during COVID, but you know, it's you need an in-person visit to have a LARC. Um, and most places in Indiana, they'll want parental permission for a LARC. So um, so these COVID policies in LARC, LARC use, so long-acting reversible contraceptive use, so the implants and the IUDs have really driven a lot of the drops in adolescent pregnancy. So disparities in access to LARC are gonna look like down the road disparities in outcomes. And we've had a big drop in well child visits. I just got a flash from the CDC that young people, particularly kids over two, so my age range, are not getting vaccinated. Um, so this well child visit has not less, the decrease in well child visits for adolescents has not just led to a decrease in vaccination, but well child visits are a way to check in with young people. Our pediatricians, family medicine doctors, nurse practitioners, um, PAs, they will screen and treat, if necessary, treat for STIs. They'll screen for interpersonal violence. They screen for sexual behavior and contraceptive needs. They work with young people about contraception. So well child, the drop in well child visits really 
eliminates um, one of the pathways for young people to get sexual and reproductive health care. Interrupting schooling has meant that there's like the little sex education that we have really was not happening on a meaningful level. And then there's been um, a drop in like if kids aren't in school, they're not going to be able to access school health services and school health services are sort of part of this safety net that we have for young people. Um, at the front of the pandemic, abortion was not deemed to be an essential service, which um, like made me a little upset because a colleague of mine um, works for a tree trimmer and they were an essential service. <laughs> and so, um, you know, but the ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology does say that this is an essential service because of the time sensitivity of it. Um, they also took, there, there were also a big increase in restrictions um, now nationally on abortions, which led to decreased access, which led to young women needing to travel longer distances. And if you think about young people, do young people have access to cars? Um, what was happening with public transit? Um, you know, so a lot of the logistic barriers w went up and they, they went up sort of unfairly for young people. And finally, with like increasing stress, dropping family income, we've seen um, an increase in all kinds of interpersonal violence. These effects were all worse for the most vulnerable. So for young people who I take care of, women, um, for people of color. So now I'm going to switch a little bit and I'm going to talk um, briefly about like how to handle this type of situation. So with the COVID policies, what we found was that we had these policies that were put in place to protect people. So like shelter in place, like having health systems move to having a lot of telehealth visits, like these were done to prevent the spread of um, a really like a, a disease that also was causing market disparities in health. So we had, there was like a balance, like protection of the community and thinking about access to sexual and reproductive health services. So as we think about that, we start thinking about approaches to it. And one approach is to look at John Stuart Mill's work around the harm principle. And this is where like least restrictive solutions come out. So John Stuart Mill is sort of famously said in a civil society, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over individuals against their will is to prevent harm to others. So that has been sort of broken out into like what we consider the harm principle. Um, or like taking a least and taking a least restrictive solution like so like what taking a least restrictive solution means is like first recognizing the moral imperative to respect individuals human rights and then to recognize that human rights can be limited to ensure the health and well-being of others but if we must limit rights then we have to take a least restrictive approach um, and what I'd like to argue is like a lot of the um, pandemic public health restrictions, which on the surface appeared to be equal, like moving to telehealth, um, uh, shelter in place, in fact, sort of disproportionately affected our most vulnerable. And I have two examples. So the first I wanted to talk about was contraceptive access. And as I thought about this, I thought about like, how do our current uh, policies affect, affect inequities in contraceptive access. So it was really clear that young people who were uninsured or young people whose families had low resources had less access to care and didn't have contraceptive access. Um, it's the, the very families um, that we, where young people are at highest risk for unintended pregnancies are the ones that are um, least likely to have, like, to make the virtual visit, um, to have, like, a working device, working Wi-Fi, um, you know, have it, uh, enough, like, loss of, like, have, like, have things be organized enough at home um, for them to do it. 
Um, so thinking about like what are the policies and how do they affect health inequities? And then like thinking about what are my public health goal is. Like my public health goal is to like provide young people with access to contraception and to re reduce teen pregnancy. So rather than the specific policy, I'm gonna think about the goal. This is for those of you who read Getting to Yes 25 years ago. This is sort of the getting to yes piece of it. Um, and then what kind of creative ideas do we have? Like one of the big barriers for minors for contraceptive access was confidentiality and and um, and being able to access confidential care. Um, we have like outside of COVID, when we're not in a public health emergency, um, we had had like many of our safety net places had walk-in clinics for teens or had same day appointments, had providers that were teen specific, really made it easy or like really reduced a lot of the, the barriers for young people getting contraception. Um, they also were willing to provide contraception without parental permission, particularly in Title X clinics. Um, and so, um, but without these, with pu the public health emergency sort of decreasing the amount of traveling, decreasing opportunities for walk-in clinics, decreasing the number of patients served at a time, um, you know, we have to think about like how else can um, minors access contraception. And one of the policy things is like, like thinking about like minor consent for contraception and telehealth and app-based programs that um, rely on telehealth laws to provide contraceptive access. So I, as an adult, can use Pandia Health um, to, or one of the other app-based contraception programs, um, but my 17-year-old daughter cannot. Um, thinking about pharmacist contraceptive prescribing laws, like it's really easy to walk into a CVS, there's almost one, there's a pharmacy in almost every neighborhood. Um, could we expand contraceptive access through Indiana having a contraceptive pres pharmacist prescribing law? It's also COVID safe, like it's one-stop shopping. Like you go to the pharmacy, you get screened if you're eligible, and most young people are eligible, you get counseled and get your method right there. And then really thinking about beefing up and providing money for school-based clinics, because the, the first thing that we worked on was getting young people back into school. It was really important for like education, for mental health. And so thinking about, can we use school-based clinics as a point of access? And what does contraception look like in a school-based clinic scenario? So again, sort of an, and, and so thinking about like, what is the least restrictive way we can do it? And can we use policy solutions to address um, uh, inequities that might result from our broader, poli from the broad policies? Um, another area of least restrictive solution was COVID and safe abortion. I mean, one of the things that didn't happen was surgical, surgical abortion really needed to be identified as an essential service to facilitate time sensitive care. Um, and then like there's been a ton of research in the past couple years on no touch and medication abortion and safety around them and having policies increase access to these types of approaches. Not every young person would qualify for a medication abortion, but many of them would. Um, and so thinking about like how to, how to increase access in this way. And I finally, like, I wanted to leave some time for questions. Um, so what I wanted to end on was something that I didn't put at the front of the talk and probably should have was like this idea of reproductive justice. And reproductive justice is a movement within the United States. It was started by an organization called Sister Song. And really, the, and it grew out of their observation that there were market disparities um, and reproductive injustices based on race, based on gender, and based on LGBTQ status, particularly for trans individuals. And so um, reproductive justice is defined as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. So it really takes a human rights framework um, and requires attention to power structures intersectionality and intersecting oppressions, um, centering marginalized groups rather than further marginalizing them, um, and joining across issues and identities. 
And so that's like sort of sort of where we're at within the United States when we think about young people's reproductive health. So, and that is the end of my talk. So I'm happy to take questions. I'm gonna stop sharing. And you can dump questions in the chat and Peter will answer them. Um, if you want to raise your hand or just speak out, you're totally welcome to unmute and speak out. And I would love to see people's faces if they are um, sort of willing to take off their camera. Hi, Mary. I have a question. Um, first of all, love this talk. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Um, I would just love to hear your thoughts. Um, and maybe this is a little too political, so you can say so. But I love the framework of thinking about this as rights and human rights and thinking about like how this is going to play into like some of the conversations happening like at the Supreme Court level about like rights and how that might transpire and change in the landscape in Indiana. Um, as, as that argument kind of switches. Yeah, I want to weep. Um, so the problem with human rights frameworks is that they have almost no traction in the United States and they don't have traction in our court sy system. And there's like, like, so the original convention on the rights of the child, like the United States wrote some of the points of that. Like we, um, our president signed it and it has never been ratified by Congress. And so like even something that is like just a no brainer, like we want to take ch care of children and respect that children have some basic rights. Um, and, and this is these are not the comments on adolescence. This is like the original basic, you know, convention on the rights of the child. Children should be free from abuse. Children should be fed. They should be clothed. They should be educated. It's not like. You know, it's basic human humanity and dignity. And so we haven't signed that. So I think that from a human rights perspective, it's really something for us as providers to start thinking about. It's for us as public health professionals, as leaders of nonprofits to start using these frameworks. And I think human rights frameworks can help us address some of the biases that we have, like even as I talked about biases that people have when they think about teens and sex. Um, but I don't think that a human rights framework will be helpful on a Supreme Court level because it hasn't been adopted officially. Many of the human rights treaties have not been signed um, by our government. And the two big ones are the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the CEDAW, and I'm going to blank on it, but on the rights of women and girls, the Cairo Accords. And I just, it's heartbreaking because I just left a na in an international adolescent health conference and that was um, centered on the Americas. And it was, you know, like many other countries that are low and middle income have more progressive um, policies around young people's rights than the United States. Any other questions? Feel free to dump questions in the chat too. I'll, I'll fill some time here and give people time to think of questions. I have, obviously can, can get you at another setting, so I don't want to take up too much time. But um, the question of rights is fascinating. I, I, I like Tracy's question before about what is the traction of rights. Like you said, it's almost tragic, right? You, you, can, you can assert them, but then the question is how you interpret each and then how you um, enforce each. And I'll say one more thing about your thoughts about rights. Um, in America, is good at negative rights, right? So the, the rights of the Bill of Rights, our rights, right? The, the ones we kind of almost invented or at least pushed forward to put it in a Bill of Rights are all negative rights to not be restricted in your speech, not be restricted in your religious performance. The ones we have trouble with are the positive rights, which I think were most of the rights you were discussing were actually positive rights, were rights to contraceptive, the rights you know, to proper instruction, Although one of them was different, I thought it was interesting, the right to not be a victim of violence. You know, that, that's more of a negative right. Yeah. So I wondered if that is something you think about when you use this framework of rights, um, both in an American context and beyond, um, partly because negative rights are more powerful and they're more commonly accepted, and also um, because they're, they're stronger here. 
Yeah, I, you know, Peter, it's just, it's, it's really hard. I mean, we do think about rights, like through like the Bill of Rights, the right to bear arms, the right to free to peaceful assembly, like the right to freedom of speech, stuff like that. Um, but our rights are somewhat circumscribed. And um, they're really they're not universal, they're really contingent on different things. So you know, like, um, you know, what was, um, as a pediatrician, I was just incredibly saddened and horrified with, by what was happening to children at the border when we had really a gross violation of basic human rights. And it's the kids weren't US citizens and they didn't have access to the protections and rights in the US Constitution. So they weren't universal. And so that's the other thing is thinking about this as, as a, these as universal rights that are that we have based on our common humanity and our shared humanity, not because we're a certain age or we're from a certain geographic area, but, you know, really making it truly universal. Okay, so Matt Field says, thinking about this from a research perspective, what are the research imperatives that must be explored to positively impact policy and make substantial change? Um, it's a that's like a really great question, Matt. Um, there's sort of two areas of research I think that um, like sort of bear attention when we think about this. The first is sort of what happens when you apply these rights in communities. And so like what happens, like look at disparities and how do disparities shift when you have programs and policies that are based on human rights framework. So thinking about like implementation and outcome things, so like behavioral research. The other area would be sort of thinking about policy research and like what high level policy types of things, like what types of national data that we have and can we link sort of policies that are consistent with basic human rights to better health outcomes. And we've seen that, I've seen that done to some extent um, with youth and um, contraception and sex education. So a group looked at, um, uh, uh, teen pregnancy data, teen birth data, and they looked at like state policies and they looked at states have this thing called a Medicaid waiver for contraceptive services. So that would be like any, it's not income, it's not based on like income or other Medicaid qualifications, like the Medicaid waivers allow them to offer the Medicaid service to everyone, regardless of income, age, et cetera, et cetera. And states that had a Medicaid waiver, when you control for like geographic region, income, racial and ethnic break, break, breakdown, urbanicity and rurality, they found that those states, the, the presence of a Medicaid waiver dropped teen birth rates. So this, and, you know, so thinking about like policy level research, like access research, those are two research areas that I think would be really helpful. One, like directly linking policies that are human rights based to improved outcomes. And the other one, looking more at your micro level and like what's happening when you have programs and micro policies or state or county level policies that are human rights based. And then how does that affect local outcomes? Okay, hey guys, your last chance for questions. There oh, is a question. Paula. There is a question in the chat. Um, how do you envision the least restrictive rights approach applying to nonprofits? And so, like the the first thing I'll have to say is like when I was thinking about more like the least least restrictive approaches, I was really thinking about governments and policies. Um, rather than programs. And I tend to think about nonprofits, but so like one of the things is like, nonprofits are really um, powerful advocates within the community. Um, and so having nonprofits advocate and speak out for, um, policies that are based in state le governmental policies that respect human rights, like nonprofits as advocates. The other thing would be for nonprofits to look at their own programs that they support and make sure that these programs are really consistent with like human rights based approaches. And then as we think about like least restrictive solutions, these the, the least restrictive solution comes up when you have um, a policy that um, 
that where an individual right is in conflict with like the health or protection of a community or another group of individuals. And I think for those like, you know, that would be something again for a nonprofit to look if they feel like they've got a situation where they have a program where they do have this conflict between sort of like respecting the basic human rights of the individuals in the program and advancing and addressing inequities um, and then sort of protecting people more broadly then sort of using this sort of like analytic approach where you're like what are the health inequities how does the policy or program affect the health inequities and then can we be creative like keeping this goal in mind that we want to protect keep the protections in place, but not, but reduce inequities, are there other solutions that we can come up with, with like sort of being goal focused rather than policy focused? I'm gonna hop in here, Mary, if you don't mind, um, just to quickly say that this is the first, but not the last of our of our here talk. This is a wonderful start. Thank you so much, Professor Ott. Um, and we do have more things coming up next Monday, uh, the 6th, we, at noon or one, we have a treats talk, which is our, our series on translational research ethics about cultural humility and equity in research uh, by Silk Soto, who many of you may, may know. And I encourage you all to, to watch your inbox for a reminder about that and come along for a nice talk about that. We'll be continuing the here talk probably monthly or bi-monthly every other month um, through 2022. Um, and so I encourage everybody to come back. But there's one more question. So I will I will stop. Oh, it's at noon. So so Silk Talk next Monday is, is, is at noon. Um, uh, Meg is going to uh, have the question for uh, for Mary, um, and um, uh, I'll just I'll just thank her for being here. We'll stay on for this final question from Dr. Gaffney. Um, somebody asked in the chat whether there's a CME code. We will try to get CME credit for these in the future. I'm sorry there was not for today, um, uh, but we we can try to make that part of the of the here series uh, for the future for sure. Uh, Mary and and Meg. I, I didn't really have a question. I thought it was a wonderful talk, Mary. Thank you. Uh, one obvious comment in my cynical nature here. I mean, one of the, I think what we haven't said is that one of the reasons that the US hasn't signed on to these conventions is that if we say that if children have a right to healthcare, if children have a right to safety, then somebody has a duty to provide that yeah. or at yeah. least not to impede it. And we have a situation where we can't even get people to put a piece of cloth on their face for an hour or 20 minutes when they go in because that's too much of an imposition. And so the notion of a common good or a common wealth, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, maybe that's why we have neighboring countries that are so much further along than we are. And I, it's just getting worse. I, I'm, uh, you know, really f feeling like I want to weep for, for the, in this bigger context. Um, yeah. The other thing I will just say, this is kind of a funny thing. Just think about this. Dermatologists see adolescents regularly. What would be really cool is if you could partner with, with unwilling dermatologists uh, in about some of the screening questions, maybe, and, and give them a, a tool. I don't know how many of my derm colleagues would go for this, but certainly in my years at Forest Manor, 17, 18 years, I saw lots and lots of young women who had lots of questions about sex and reproduction and contraception. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a captive place there. Anyway, just a thought. It's Meg, it's actually a brilliant idea um, because Accutane is a teratogen and that's one of the biggest reasons young people go and they have to do like the like online Accutane pledge and stuff like that. But wouldn't it be great if the dermatologist could say in addition to doing like the Accutane eye pledge program, I would like you to do a telehealth visit with an adolescent provider and then I will send the prescription in. Um, you know, it would be really like, or with a family planning or with it, you know, like we have like phenomenal family health nurse practitioners who would be great at this type of thing. Wonderful. And not only about um, reproductive health, but I saw lots of, not lots, but many young women who were dropping out of school. And part of my clinical duty, I thought was to, to talk to them about, okay, what's happening and why is this happening? How can we help you get back to the point where you can go back to school? Um, anyway, so it's just a funny, 
Okay. Thank you, Mary. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again, uh, Mary, and thanks everybody for being here.